If you would like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. More information in the description below. Even with the best of intentions, things can go terribly wrong. Those most pure of heart can cast a shadow over the world, though they meant no harm. We can begin at the start, at the birth of the planet, a formless, wild world. But during this era, when time had no meaning, when a blink of the universe could be countless lifetimes, something unknowable and mysterious also happened. A creature, a parasite, was flying through space, its origins unknown, its true name unknown. But this blossoming world was in its path, whether intentional or not, doesn't matter. While it traveled, this world grew. The primordial dream stone was there at the dawn of this world, a glorious red stone which in ages to come would be used to craft powerful items. But that will take time, let's not get ahead of ourselves. When life finally emerged some 65 million years before our tale truly begins, it was in the form of sentient reptilian folk called the Reptite. Then humanity followed some ages later. The Reptite proved to be territorial and warlike against the young humanoids, and conflict arose between them. The details of their conflict are not yet of consequence, because this world was changed after a cataclysmic event. That alien parasitic creature appeared in the sky like a bright red star getting ready to fall. As it came closer, as the minutes counted down, all conflict seemed unimportant. Tribes fell together against the terror, having no idea what was going on. Amongst the Ioka people, one of their greatest warriors called it Lavos, meaning fire and big in their tongue. Lavos impacted the earth and brought about an era of ice. The reptites were wiped out and humanity was weakened, but they lived on, they adapted. For millions of years, the earth was covered in ice, and what life persevered had to struggle against terrible storms and bone-shattering cold. But there was a turning point for humanity, the discovery of magic. The potential to interact with it was only within some humans, and because they could interact with it, they were elevated as a result. They used their magics to work together to create a new kingdom that they called Zeal. The primordial stone called Dreamstone aided them in this creation, only those who could use magic were welcomed within zeal. They used their magical talents to raise the kingdom high into the sky, away from the terrible rage of eternal winter. Those unfortunates who did not possess magical talents were left to fend for themselves on the earth below, seen as lessers than those that retreated into the sky. But despite the terrible hand that they were dealt, those without magic survived on. But this kingdom called Zeal soon found a doom cast upon it. The queen, called Zeal after the kingdom, and her gurus called Gaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar began to study the being called Lavos. They believed that they could harness the power of the slumbering parasite and use it not only to enhance their own powers, but also to become immortal. But they were fools, all of them. The guru, Melchior, created the Mammon Machine, which would harness the powers of Lavos. Only a special pendant could turn it on, and only the wearer of the pendant could control the Mammon Machine. It was given to the Queen Zeal's daughter, Scala. She was particularly gifted when it came to magic, and she was trusted by the Queen, which made her the perfect candidate to be in control of the Mammon Machine. When the machine was first activated and began siphoning the power of Lavos, the Queen herself changed, as though overnight. She became demanding, secretive, and cruel. Anyone who opposed her was made to disappear, even her own gurus. Queen Zeal's cruelty also extended to her daughter eventually. She pushed harder every day for Scala to operate the Mammon machine. The gurus warned the queen that taking the machine too far could spell disaster, but she did not heed it. The queen demanded that the machine be pushed farther, and it woke up Lavos. Rifts through time itself were torn open, and the three gurus were pulled into them. So too was a child called Janus, the little brother of Scala and Queen Zeal's son, who was creeping around in a place that he did not belong. Melchior was cast about 13,000 years into the future. Balthazar was cast about 14,300 years into the future. Gaspar was thrown into the formless end of time, and little Janus landed about 12,600 years in the future, all on his own. In that far-flung era, the boy would learn that the magical kingdom called Zeal fell into the sea and was a nigh-forgotten place. A fear and a rage built up within Janus, and it was directed at Lavos. He would spend his life dedicated to finding a way to kill it, and then somehow he would find his sister Scala. But after the fall of the kingdom Zeal, Lavos did not cause any more mayhem. It had spent millions of years feeding off the energies of the planet, but it was not yet ready to awake. So, Lavos went back to sleep, and those displaced in time pursued their own goals, they lived their own lives. 
After the Kingdom of Zeal was destroyed, humanity suffered, but they did eventually recover. 12,000 years later, the Kingdom of Guardia was founded, which marked the year one on the calendar. Our journey begins 1,000 years after the foundation of the Kingdom, during a grand celebration in Guardia called the Millennial Fair. We go to a small town called Truce in the year 1000 AD. A young man is waking up, and his story will change the lore of the entire planet. This video is supported by patrons on Patreon and YouTube members. Want to help out the channel? Patreon.com slash Tiptoe the Tank or become a member on YouTube. Starting at $2 a month, you can help provide stability and longevity to the channels. Join in on Patreon and member-only streams, get access to early and extra content, and maybe even decide what comes next on the channel. Patrons and members help us thrive. Patreon.com slash Tiptoe the Tank to sign up or see the description below for the link to become a YouTube member. It's like a Twitch sub only. God, so much better. Now, back to the lore. When young Chrono awakes, it's because of his mother. The morning is well underway, and the Millennial Fair is kicking off, so it's time for Mr. Lazy Bones to get up and moving. His mother kind of talks to him like he's a child, but Chrono is entering his adult years, so once he's up and at it, he's off to spend the day how he pleases. And from the get-go, it's apparent that Chrono is a real stand-up guy with a wholesome streak, the sort of friend that we all wish we could have, but also the sort of human being that only really seems to exist in fiction. His mother reminds him that he needs to go see his friend Luca at the fairgrounds on Lean Square. Luca is quite the inventor and has something that she'll be displaying, so it's on his list of things to be done today. He takes his time socializing, looking around, eventually making it to the fair where there are games to be played, merch to be bought, and folks to be hung around with. It's just a carefree, simple day. The sort of experience that just hits different for a youth who doesn't carry any excess weight from the world. Everything he could want or need can be earned on site, and anything that he can't obtain just sort of is unnecessary. While running through the north part of the square, Chrono accidentally runs into a young lady, hard enough that they both get knocked down. The young gal rises and immediately starts looking for a pendant that she dropped, which Chrono rushes to retrieve for her, with an earnest apology for the collision. But it was an honest accident, nobody's fault, and the two hit it off. They decide to walk around the fair together, and she introduces herself as Marl. Together, they try to help a girl find her cat to no avail, they get into a drinking contest, wander into a tent of horrors, they got Marl all the candy that she could stomach, and then they find themselves at Luca's setup. She and her father, Taven, are showcasing a teleportation device, and though they put on a confident front, it seems like it might not be the most dependable of devices, and maybe a bit on the dangerous side. So no one really wants to step forward to volunteer trying it out. That is, until Chrono steps up and does Luca a solid by putting his life on the line as a guinea pig. Fortunately though, it works, and Chrono is teleported from one pad to the other with all organs still inside his body and all limbs attached in their proper places. Would have been unfortunate had he been teleported and ended up inside out. But even after Chrono's successful demo, no one really wants to step up to try it out, except Marl. She's all too willing to give it a go now. Luca fully accepts Marl's presence and her desire to try out their machine, so on she goes. And then, ah, uh, well, something doesn't necessarily go wrong, it just goes awry. See, there's a difference. They didn't make Marl inside out, they just made her not exist here. Luca immediately sees that something beyond their control impacted the function of their machine. A big old portal opens up and gobbles Marl down. Her vanishing act left behind that pendant and Luca hones in on it. Something about it caused a reaction with the machine, so they'll emulate it and see if they can recreate what happened. Another portal opens up and this time it takes Chrono in. He's thrown through an unknown scape and comes out on a mountainside in a place quite unfamiliar and quite hostile. Lucky for Chrono that he's got some sword play under his belt and a weapon on his back. He has to fight his way down the mountainside, and while the landscape is familiar, the details are a bit off. He's near his hometown of Truce, and standing where Lean Square should be, but it's not here. And after some investigation, Chrono finds that he's in the year 600 AD, about 400 years in the past. There's a war at the kingdom's doorstep to the south, and rumors that the long-missing queen has recently been found in a nearby canyon. It's all very strange and difficult to piece together. With the whisperings of war looming and the strange goings-ons with the queen, Chrono decides to just head for the castle to see if he can get any clues as to where Marl is because really, she is his priority in all of this. 
He's initially met with suspicion by the guards at the entrance, but the people of this time are war-hardened, and Chrono clearly is not. They view him as a young man of no consequence, at least not to them. And the thought that he could be serving the villain called the Fiend Lord is laughable. Well, thanks for that vote of confidence. The Queen interrupts their meeting, or at least they call her the Queen, Queen Lean. She looks exactly like Marl, though, and that she is sticking up for Chrono is... Well, something here isn't really adding up, is it? The king apparently knows of Chrono and thanks him for helping rescue his wife, which Chrono never did, but okay, bro. The king grants him run of the castle and a place to rest, which Chrono uses, before searching the castle to find this queen. She's in her private quarters, and once they're alone, she reveals herself to actually be Marl, and she's just as confused as Chrono is. Seems that she came out of her portal in that canyon, and the locals mistook her for the queen because they look so much alike. Queen Lean is an ancestor of Marl's, but before they can speak any further, the room darkens and Marl begins to feel fear and pain. She cries out that it feels like she's dying and then she's just sort of gone. Chrono was the last one seen with her, and if the guards find out that their queen is missing again, there will be big trouble for Chrono, so he hightails it out. And look at who has managed to find their own way here, it's Luca. She is a welcome sight, and she stops his manic running through the castle. She's managed to figure out that Marl is actually the princess of Guardia in their proper time, and that her real name is Nadia. Now, here is where our issues begin. If Marl had not come here, if she had not been found, the search for Queen Lean would have carried on. The proper queen would have been found eventually, saved, and all would have been well. But because they found Marl, the search was called off. So Queen Lean was never found. She is still in grave danger, and if the queen is killed, it could threaten their time in the future. The queen's descendants would never exist, which means Marl would never exist. Things get messy with timelines. And just Marl's arrival has caused an effect which will impact the future directly, so they need to try and correct this, which means they need to find the Queen and Marl both. The first stop is a cathedral within a forest clearing. It looks like a nice enough place, but what turns out to be inside isn't so nice. The nuns within speak very strangely with veiled threats. When Luca and Chrono find Queen Lean's hairpin on an altar, the nuns play out their hands. Turns out, they're actually strange Naga creatures, which means this place needs to be investigated. They'd heard whispers of someone called the Fiend Lord causing havoc on the kingdom, and these are certainly fiends. At the end of their fight, one of them pops out to attack again, but a strange creature steps in to aid Chrono and Luca. He says that he's here to empty the pit of villainy within the cathedral and offers the duo aid in their venture. This is Frog, and let's be honest, Frog is the real hero of this story. Look at this beast of a specimen. The now trio fight together through the cathedral and discover as they go that the fiends are here impersonating people, like the chancellor that they met at the castle was actually a fiend in disguise, and the true Queen Lean is being kept here. But the fiend's real goal in all this really just seems to be causing an uproar, like this is meant to be a big distraction. Someone named Yakra is behind all this, and they need to find him and stop him. Turns out that it was Yakra himself impersonating the Chancellor in the castle, and he is the first big foe that Chrono and Luca have to contend with. Frog turns out to be an invaluable friend to have, as he's battle-worn and ready to face down any fiend that comes across his path. Together, the trio put Yakra down, the Queen is freed from its control, and Calm is returned to the kingdom. Seems that Queen Lean knows Frog, and she is quite happy to see her friend again. They find the real Chancellor tied up nearby, and together, they all get back to the castle. But the Queen's restoration isn't the end of trouble. There's still the issue of war to the south drawing closer and closer, and they haven't found Morrow yet. Then, to make things worse, Frog departs from the group in shame for failing to protect the Queen. He thinks that his presence was what endangered her in the first place, but he's just so hard on himself. He takes all the blame for everything happening. Luca and Chrono have to proceed alone. Luca thinks that maybe with the timeline restored, Marl will pop up where she vanished from, and thankfully, she's correct. Marl reappears in the Queen's quarters, and Luca properly addresses her as Princess Nadia. No more games or pretending for her, but the princess asks that instead they call her Marl, not Nadia. She doesn't want to be treated differently or special, which they'll happily comply with because let's be real, nobody wants to pamper a little princess. So, now that they've gotten her back, it's time to head home to their proper time. They head back up that mountain that they came from back to that portal. 
Luca has taken to calling them gates and proudly announces that she has built a key for them. With Luca's key, they can stabilize these portals and travel through them back to other times and places. But where these gates came from in the first place is still a bit of a mystery. It's hard to believe that her telepad back at the fair caused this, so something or someone else has to be at play here. They are finally back at home though, right back at the fairgrounds. Luca is going to keep studying the portal and Krona will take the princess home. As soon as the two of them step foot in the castle, there's even more trouble. The princess was reported as kidnapped and Krono is the prime suspect. Never mind that she's safely returned and that she insists that Krono is innocent of wrongdoing. It seems that there's a cycle of hard-headed obtuseness amongst those that run the kingdom and Marl is clearly well acquainted with their disrespect and blind anger. Even the castle guards are uncertain about this, but what choice do they have against an authority figure? Krono is arrested, Marl is taken away, and a trial promptly begins. It's a total farce though. Nothing about this trial is valid, as though someone has an agenda here. The Chancellor recounts parts of Krono's day to him, asking if he did the moral and right things, as though Krono could see into the future and know that helping a little girl find her cat would mean the difference between life and death in about two hours. It's ridiculous, and to make things even more idiotic, Krono is found innocent of all wrongdoing, and he is still taken to prison for three days of solitary confinement, and then to take it a step further, the Chancellor shows up at the prison intake and decides that Krono is going to be executed. Like, where is this logic coming from? I think that the King of Guardia is a villain here and Meryl is his spawn. At least he is if this is really how he lets things be run under his care. It is so baffling. And this unjust sentence forces Krono's hand. He busts out of prison, he takes the guards out as he goes, he reunites with Luca and saves a fellow prisoner along the way from another unjust execution but things get messier with each step. Before Luca and Krono make it out, the Chancellor sends a dragon tank to kill them on a walkway. It's highly unnecessary, but the two handle the brute with ease. One of the castle guards had dropped instructions on specifically how to handle this thing, and after it's destroyed, all remaining roadblocks are cleared, at least for now. They have a small break in the bad luck, but before making it out of the castle, the guards try to corner them. The princess attempts to intervene, but despite her protests, no one will listen. Her father and the chancellor just bulldoze over what she has to say, so she abandons them. The three of them make another break for it and make it out of the castle into the forest with the guards on their heels. They're forced into a nearby field where there just so happens to be another one of those gates. Pretty, uh, pretty fortunate. Bit of a, uh, deus ex machina moment. Ah, uh, bit, uh, convenient. Hmm. Well, who am I to speculate? The three of them are able to jump through it using Luca's gate key, and where they pop out is... It's a whole new kind of worrying. This is a wasteland, and littering it are ramshackle domes that once housed life and prosperity. Something terrible happened here, but it's so alien to the crew that it's impossible to even speculate possibilities. There are clusters of survivors within the domes, but they're emaciated and tired. Their food stores can't be reached, they can't survive outside for long, and hostile robotics litter the domes beyond the safety of their quartered off safe areas. There's not a lot of time left for these people. This is 2300 AD. This is the future. It is dire and it is bleak. They fight their way to the Eris Dome, which lay beyond the rubble of old cities. Within the dome, they find another group of survivors, and hearing that there are others still alive past the old ruins is uplifting for them, so they're not the only ones left. They're far too weak to fight their way through those ruins, though, so they can't act on any of this information. The trio learns that to the east is the Proto-Dome, a place of importance that's long been overrun with maddened robots. But before they leave, the elder leader of this group tells them that beneath their very feet is a food storage facility, but they haven't been able to reach the food because of rogue robots patrolling the halls. All that have gone down in search of the food haven't come back, and their friends and families are deeply worried about them. So the trio decide that they will delve into the depths of the dome to scope out any survivors or food. And what they find below is frustrating and exceedingly dangerous. A security system that kills on sight, and then a corpse. The only one that they could find. Who knows what happened to the rest of the people who came down here. But worse yet, the food storage has been destroyed. It's completely rotted out with nothing remaining. All they find is a single seed, clutched firmly in the hand of the dead man. They come across a supercomputer that Luca is able to get her hands on. And with it, they find another gate, but it's pretty far to the east and it will be a dangerous venture. Not that they really have a choice, though. 
Nestled in the records of the computer is a log that details the day of Lavos in 1999 AD, about a thousand years after their proper time. The domed cities of this point in time are in far better shape. The land is clear and healthy. But on this day, the alien parasite Lavos tore its way out of the ground and brought hellfire down on the inhabitants of the planet. It destroyed everything, countless died, and this world never recovered from that apocalypse. It's well beyond their lifetimes, but it's still a shock to them, in a future that they can't allow to happen. Everything in them is resistant to it. Marl asks if they can go back to the gates to save the future, like how they saved her in 600 AD. They could find out what happened and somehow stop it. Well, a wise man once said that history abhors a paradox. And that's true here too. The events of the past and future may be tampered with, but the end results typically remain the same. Like, go to the past and dethrone a tyrant that's starting a war, and someone else will rise up in his place to execute that same war. The details change, the end result doesn't. Significantly changing the events of time is no small endeavor, but they'll try. The worst that can happen is, you know, the world tearing itself apart, right? Before they venture east, they give the survivors of this dome that seed. Who knows what it will turn out to be, but the elder of the group promises that they will do their best to help it grow. It's not much, given that their food stores are gone and loved ones that went below will never come back, but it's a tiny glimmer of hope. That's all the trio can give them now. That gate was detected within the protodome, and getting there is one hell of a trip. They come across all sorts of characters and obstacles. Within the protodome, they find another interesting fellow, an old robot that seems to be shut down. Luca is able to get it back up and going again, and it introduces itself as Robo. It takes a few tries to get it out of a subservient mindset, and the two parties have quite a bit to share with one another about different eras and intentions. The gate that they need to reach is beyond a locked door, and power needs to be restored in order to open it, so Robo will accompany them on their journey. The trio is now four. With their new robotic friend, they make it to a northern facility and get the power turned back on, which on paper is only one sentence, in practice it's about two hours of pain in the nutsack to get the power back. But they succeed despite the many roadblocks they have to face. While exiting the facility, they're jumped by a group of Robo's old companions, but they see Robo as defective and are extremely hostile towards him. With no hesitation, the entire group starts beating on Robo, tearing the poor thing to pieces right in front of Chrono and Luca. Then they toss him into the trash. They manage to take down the hostile robots, but just barely. When they manage to fish Robo out, he's completely non-functional. Even Luca doesn't know if he can be fixed. They drag him back to the protodome, and bit by bit, Luca puts him back together. With the power restored, they could have left at any time, but they chose to stay and help Robo gaining a powerful ally and a true friend in the process. Luca encourages him to think for himself, to decide what he wants to do and not do according to the orders of others. And Robo chooses to stay with them, to face whatever may come together. With their new friend in tow, the four of them leap into the time gate. Well, this was unexpected. The four of them don't land in any particular place. It's a long time off, the end of time. Here, one of the gurus from the long-lost kingdom of Zeal stays, Gaspar, but he doesn't state his true name or explain his backstory. He's just the old man. Though mysterious, he will act as a gentle guide to them should they lose their way, but he will not overstate anything to them. The old man makes it clear that they're not the first ones here. Travelers lost in time's flow end up here like driftwood. He explains that only three of them may pass through the gates at any time. Any more than that, and they'll just end up here at the end of time. Extra party members must remain here if the total is more than three. It will act as a safe haven against the perils of the world. The Pillars of Light act as gates to different times and places, a sort of travel hub that they will be able to freely use. They will be returning here time and time again, but for now, they need to search for answers back in 1000 AD. They need to see if they can research the past and discover more about Lavos. When they pop out, it's in a place called Medina, which is populated by fiends. When they were in 600 AD, they learned that fiends were instigating a war with humans, that they were led by somebody called the Fiend Lord. They lost that war, and now descendants of those war fiends have settled down here. And boy do they hate humans! Goods and services are extremely expensive for non-fiends here, and some inhabitants are outright hostile with them. And at the village square of Medina, there is some weird crazy going down. Amidst the dancing and the chanting, they learned that the fiend lord's name was Magus, and he had something to do with Lavos. 
These fiends want Lavos to awaken because they think that the destruction it will bring will only apply to humans. When Lavos returns, it will destroy humanity and then fiends will rule the world. Yeah, that's not really what's gonna happen though. Everyone gets pillaged equally, including you. This Magus character was around 400 years prior to this time, so it's time to go back to the past and hunt him down. They already have a pretty good idea that he'll be someplace to the south, so off they go. First, they'll need to head back towards human territory, which requires going through Hecran Cave and killing a whole lot of fiends. They're really hellbent on Lavos coming back to finish their dirty work. Even 400 years later, they cling to old hatred like it's a lifeline. Once they're back in more familiar territory, they do some looking around and make sure that things are still in order. Then they make their way to the fairgrounds to use the gate there. Then it's back to 600 AD with them. I wonder how Frog is doing. They land back on that mountainside from not too long ago and know exactly where to go from here. Zenon Bridge is where the current stand is taking place to hold back fiends from the south. Should the Fire Lord's forces make it across that bridge, they'll have a straight shot to the castle. Chrono and crew help out the tired and hungry soldiers on the line, helping them push back the invaders after bringing them a new round of supplies. Their king was injured during an attack, so morale has been extremely low. Their help was a huge boost for the troops, and it was deeply appreciated. The one leading the charge at Zenon Bridge was a fool named Ozzy. He fled when things got too hairy, but it's almost a certainty that he'll be popping up again soon. Once they have access to the southern part of the landmass, they're able to start hunting down this Magus character. There have been whispers of a great hero appearing, as though from the pages of legend. But it's not about Chrono or any of his group, so who is this great hero that everyone is talking about? And what's the truth behind his weapon that people call the Masamune? Well, if they can find this legendary hero, he would definitely be a good ally to have. An old man at a dusty tavern says that a strange monster was here talking about that blade. A strange frog character. Hmm. Some of the town folk here seem to think that a local child is the legendary hero, which seems like a bit of a stretch, but okay. They get a lead taking them to the Denodoro Mountains, where it's said a terrible beast rests guarding the Masamune. While roaming, they find themselves in a cursed forest, but there's no path nearby, no blade to be found. They're in the completely wrong neighborhood. There is, however, a coyly hidden shelter. Here, they reunite with Frog. Last time they'd seen him, Frog was pretty depressed at his failure to prevent the queen's kidnapping. But now his spirits seem a bit more fair, at least until he hears that the king has been injured in battle. Then he's right back to his cloudy mood. Frog says that he can be of no help. There's nothing that he can do. He's fallen into his depressive state once again, so they just leave the poor fellow alone. The journey up the mountain, once they find it, isn't too difficult. There's nothing that threatening in their way. Remember that kid that some folks were praising as the hero of legend? Well, he's here and really not doing too great. He had enough sense to flee the monsters on the mountain to find safety, so count him out as the hero that they've been wanting to find. High atop the mountain, they find a cave tucked away amid some waterfalls, and within are more kids? One calls himself the Wind, but plays around like he's an honest child. And then deeper in the cave, there's a sword buried in stone, but the child really does not want Chrono going near it. He tells Chrono to just hold on a minute, and then he calls to his brother, Masa. These apparent twins aren't human. They're the spirits of the blade, and they're not about to let anyone but their chosen hero handle this blade. How the Masamune is used is far more important than being the strongest wielder. They fight Masa and Mune through two phases, and they best the twin spirits, but they don't relinquish control over the blade to them. They will not budge on this. They allow Chrono to safekeep it, though, and to find its proper owner. First, though, the blade has been damaged and is in need of repairs. The rest of its journey is up to them to figure out. Back in the nearby town of Por, they find that kid who was fleeing the mountain, the one that several adults claimed was the hero of legend. He tells Chrono the truth. The hero's badge that he had on him was something that he had taken from a tavern floor. It had fallen off a froggish character, and this kid claimed it for himself. So, by that logic, that means Frog is the hero and that the Masamune is his to wield. See, I told you Frog was the real hero of the story. They beeline back to Frog's mopey man cave in the forest and confront him about it. He knows well of the Masamune. He knows that it's broken, but even if it was repaired, he believes that he has no right to wield it. There's a history here that's broken his confidence in himself to the point that he won't even entertain the idea of fighting anymore. He won't even hint as to what's wrong with him. He allows them to take the hilt of the broken blade, and Robo deciphers an archaic script etched into it. It's a name, Melchior. 
They've met someone by that name. It was an old man near the fiend village of Medina in the year 1000 A.D. In the future, from this point in time, but he was a pretty nondescript general vendor. Hard to believe that his name would be etched into a legendary blade. Why would a man from the future have any business with a blade from the long past? But since Frog won't pursue the matter, they will. They take both parts of the blade with them and travel through the time gate. Forward they go back to 1000 AD to the house of Melchior, and all their preconceived notions of him are shattered. He doesn't deny that he knows the blade and that he can repair it, but doing so would require Dreamstone, something that has been long lost from this world. It existed in prehistoric times, but eventually it was overmined and used up. It was more valuable than gold and highly sought after. If they can somehow find Dreamstone, then he'll happily repair it, otherwise it's just impossible for the Masamune to be made whole again. They don't have a whole lot to go on, but the old man at the end of time comes through for them on this one. He asks them if they've considered maybe just going back to a prehistoric era, just taking a look around. There's a pillar of light up there that will take them back to 65 million BC, so why not go see? Well, fortune favors the bold, so off they go, courageously plunging as far back in time as they can reach. And there's trouble from the get-go. The gate drops them off into a pack of green, scaly, reptile-like creatures. But someone has been watching from the jungle. A warrior from a nearby tribe springs into action to lend aid to these out-of-place strangers. This is Ayla, and she's such a skilled fighter that she is the leader of her tribe. She lives for a good fight and has a heart of gold. Even if she doesn't fully understand what's happening, she knows right from wrong, and she steps in to aid these strangers. When she has the reptite's attention, she leads most of them away so that Chrono and his team can have a more even playing field. While they fight it out with these handfuls, Ayla takes care of the rest and circles back to introduce herself. She appreciates that Chrono and his pals are strong, she respects that, and out of respect for their strength, she will act as their guide and she leads them towards her village. It just so happens that this is the very night her people, the Ayoka, are having a big party and they are now invited. At the Big Bash, Ayla introduces her new friends and the Ioka people immediately accept their presence. That is, all except one character in the corner that seems to be pouting. He is Kino, Ayla's beloved, and Kino is wearing an ugly shade of jealousy. He dislikes them because Ayla is giving them attention, and his insecurities boil over. Rather than talk to Ayla about it, Kino has decided to brood and fester over it. Tip from tip, don't do this, talk to your partner, nobody likes a brooding bastard. But Kino's pouting aside, this is a wholesome and fun night full of drinking, music, and dancing. Ayla and Chrono get into a drinking contest, and when Chrono just barely manages to beat her, she gifts to him a chunk of Dreamstone, just what they needed. This is a wonderful development. But rather than immediately depart and return to Melchior, they decide to spend the evening with the Ioka people in celebration. And as these things sometimes tend to go, everyone gets a bit hammered and ends up passing out in the field. And when they finally wake up, Luca is terrified to discover that someone has taken the gate key. Without that, they're trapped in this time. The only clues they have to follow are some tracks around the party grounds. But first they go see Ayla. She is the chief of these people, so she should be involved in the search. She leaps into action and takes one of the spots on the team. She's the best and strongest fighter in these parts, so she is more than welcome. The search eventually takes them to the forest maze just south of the tribe's land, where Kino is hanging out. He admits to being the thief. He admits that he was jealous of them. And she lashes out at him, asking what the hell was he thinking? Such implications were hurtful to her because she likes Kino best, and this was a betrayal of trust. To Kino's credit, he tells everyone that he is sorry. But the reptites of this forest took the gate key from him. Ayla sends Kino back to the village to protect it while she's away, and the trio begins searching the forest for the key. At the heart of this maze is the reptite lair, their base of operation, and where they would have taken something as valuable as the gate key. It's a maze of tunnels and paths that are hard to make sense of, but deep in the heart of it, they find a being called Azela. And while the residents of the reptite lair seem a bit primitive, Azela is anything but. She recognizes that the gate key is an extremely advanced creation, and she's baffled as to how the humans came to possess something like it. What purpose could something like it even serve, she wonders. Well, Chrono tells her precisely what it is, and the thought is so preposterous to hear that she believes him to be lying. And then the attack commences. Azela doesn't fight, at least not now. One of her underlings steps in with the intention of wiping them out, but they don't succeed. Azela, for whatever reason, did not take this opportunity to escape the lair with the gate key. 
Instead, once her minion is killed, she's forced to hand over the gate key, and then she leaves. Well, that certainly was an adventure. They have the dream stone, and they have the gate key, so it's time to get going. Back to the safety of the Ioka village, the party bids farewell to Ayla and Kino. They've made friends here and are welcome back anytime. But for now, it's time to get back to Melchior in 1000 AD to have the Masamune repaired. That they possess the needed Dreamstone is an exquisite surprise to Melchior. He asks for no payment in repairing the blade, instead just stating his nigh disbelief that this is happening, and then getting right to work with Luca at his side to assist him. It takes both of them working together for a great deal of time, but they succeed in fully restoring the old blade. The Masamune is a powerful weapon meant for only one being, and they know precisely who was meant to hold it. With no further obstacles, they return to 600 AD to search for the brave Night Frog. And he's precisely where they expect him to be, hiding from the world in his underground home, completely alone and shut away. When he sees the Masamune, he's almost without words. He doesn't rush his reactions or speed towards his thoughts. He invites them to stay the night in his home so that he can have the evening to ponder these events. While they rest, Frog remembers events from his life. What steps brought him here to this point? He had a friend, a great knight named Cyrus, who had the favor of the king and the queen. He remembers a time when his friend was departing to reclaim the hero's badge from the terrible Frog King. Then Cyrus meets with him at the castle doors. He's human though, and they call him Glenn. Oh my, this was long ago indeed. Cyrus and Glenn fought through the kingdom together and succeeded in defeating the terrible Frog King and reclaiming the hero's badge. Then, another memory. Cyrus has lost his blade, the Masamune, over the side of a cliff. He and Glenn are facing off against Ozzy and another unknown humanoid. What is clear is that Cyrus and Glenn are soon to be defeated. In desperation, Cyrus orders Glenn to flee. Cyrus has no chance of escape, but Glenn does. But the young man just doesn't have it in him to abandon his friend. Then, the other humanoid speaks. This is Magus, the Fiend Lord himself. The one who would bring war and chaos to the kingdom. In a moment of desperation, Cyrus tries to charge Magus to stop him somehow, but he failed. Magus delivered a fatal hit to the knight. His last request to Glenn was to see that the queen was protected, and then his body is burned away. Ozzy called Glenn a scared little frog with no pawn to jump into. And then in a moment of cruelty, Magus cursed Glenn to match Ozzy's insult. He fell from the cliffside into a pool of water down below. Much later, when Glenn finally awoke, he found himself to have the form of a frog. Ten years have passed, a decade for Frog to be brought before the Masamune, Cyrus's old blade. He calls upon his guests to awaken. It's time that they depart. Frog will join them. He bids them travel to Magus's keep. He has unfinished business with the Fiend Lord. The path to reach Magus is impassable. The mountain that keeps the path to Magus's lair has been sealed shut with immovable stone. Frog steps forward and remembers his old friend Cyrus, their youth together. Cyrus is knighting, their ventures through the world, and then his death. Cyrus was definitely the star of the duo, but Frog, or rather Glenn, was a humble swordsman, and in his decade alone, he has become unmatched in skill. Frog holds the Masamune high, and as its champion, he wields the power within it against the mountain. He slices it cleanly in two. The way forward is clear and nothing will stop them now. Through a mountain of beasts and foes they go, to a landmass just separate from the main. There they find where Magus roamed. The only beings that they find at the start are specters of each person's life. Chrono's mother, Luca's father, Queen Lean. They all call out to the party as though to distract them, but it's clear that they're just pawns in some strange game. After a bit of searching, they find Ozzy, one of Magus's leaders. He's here to greet them on Magus's behalf. The Fiend Lord himself is a bit too busy for them, so Ozzy and his comrades, Slash and Flea, will handle them instead. Their free roam is over. If they wish to proceed, they must fight through each hall to reach one of the leaders. First up is Slash the Swordsman. He's a worthy combatant, yes, but Frog in particular brings heavy damage, making him the first of Magus's leaders to fall. Then the Magician Flea, who has actually been following them this whole time in the form of a bat so they know exactly what they're getting into with this group. Flea is boastful, prideful, and vain to the core, but deviously strong as well. They do not stop the group, though. They cut Flea down and begin the search for their next target, Ozzy. They find him higher in the keep, 
And like a fool, he tries to impede their progress with cheap tricks and traps. All he's really doing, though, is delaying the inevitable, because nothing that he has to throw at them is really that substantial. It's a long pursuit that tests the patience of all involved. But they manage to corner Ozzy within a throne room. There's no place left to run. He has to face them now. But even in this, he proves himself to be a coward. He casts himself into ice, making him invulnerable to their strikes, but he's undone with his own traps. The trio activate the cranes nearby and drop the floor out from underneath Ozzy, sending him plummeting far, far below. Now only Magus himself remains. When they find him, he's casting a spell. Magus intends to see Lavos returned, but his motivations are not yet clear. If his underlings are to be believed, then Lavos will return and destroy only the humans that walk the earth, leaving it for them to rule over, but Magus surely doesn't believe that's what's going to happen, right? Frog takes the lead in their approach, as is his right. When Magus finally acknowledges them, Frog holds back his anger long enough for words to be exchanged. He expresses an indignant thankfulness for his transformation into a frog, because without it, he wouldn't have become the unparalleled sword fighter that he is now, and he draws out the Masamune. Magus immediately recognizes the blade, and he knows that Frog is here to kill him for what he did to Cyrus. Had Chrono and Luca not interfered with this time, then Frog never would have come here. Magus would have continued on trying to bring forth Lavos, and he would have succeeded. It wouldn't have been a full awakening, Lavos would have stirred and consumed Magus, ending his life here. Their battle has interrupted that. It's interrupted Magus' summoning of the parasite. And when their fight nears its end, something unexpected and new happens. The keep begins to shudder and shake, and Magus curses their intrusion upon his work. When questioned as to his motives, he exclaims that he isn't here to do anything other than kill Lavos, not bring him forth. Their actions here have caused a break in time. Magus is not killed by Lavos. Instead, time portals are opened. Magus is thrown wildly into an unknown time, and the trio are taken farther yet back. Back to 65 million BC.